<laughs> All right, so for our next speaker, uh, uh, Tom is going to do the intro. This is a keynote. It's our first keynote. We'll have a keynote every day. I'll hand it over to Tom. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing our first keynote speaker, Shurjit Mukherjee. Uh, Shurjit is a VP of Engineering at Cumulus, um, manages, uh, manages the team working on a network operating system in Linux, uh, has done some nice contributions in the uh, VRF area, uh, looking through the patches. There are actually some. Um, has a great background, uh, let's see, Cisco, Precision IO, Silicon Graphics. Um, but more importantly, what I found is he's quite passionate, um, does like a good argument. Um, and even though he's attained the high lofty title of VP of Engineering, um, he actually has a really good sense of humor and in fact has that touch of cynicism that's a great homework in a, in a true uh, kernel engineer. So without any further ado, uh, Shurjit, take it away. Thank you, Tom. No, not really. It should be on. It's on? Okay. All right, so thank you for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. I was expecting more of my sense of humor to get tested, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, I, I'm going to actually uh, talk a little bit, this talk is a little bit counterculture for this group. Uh, I'm here really to explain a little bit about what Cumulus Networks does, why we think it's important, and you'll see in this talk that it's going to take some of the things that most of the people in this room focus on, work on, on a daily basis, on a slight tangent, but you'll see why everything that everybody here and the, the larger community has been working on is very relevant and, and is an interesting application of, of the same. So this is just sort of an introduction. I want to set the stage to say that, look, I mean, we know that networking in Linux runs on everything from that small little device to that large set of computers and infrastructure that runs over there. Most of us on our day job or in our day job focus on one or two or three of those aspects. There are, of course, exceptions, people like David who have to worry about the whole gamut. But it is important, I think, for us as a community to understand that there is a really large gamut and the ways in which things that are being done by this community affect everybody is often very hard to fathom, and in fact, I would say impossible to fathom. So if you look inside a data center, and I'm going to restrict my conversation to entirely the enterprise and the data center, as, my, as the headline says, and if you look at all the talks in this conference, most of them focus on the layers, the top three layers up there, where it says virtual machines, virtual switches, physical servers. And those little black uh, spider-like icons indicate where your Linux kernel networking stack is in operation. And I think it's highly um, non-controversial and something we can all agree on that in those upper three layers and all the applications of networking as we know it, um, Linux is dominant. It may not be 100%, but it's very, very close. And this is where things lie today. Now, the point I'm here to talk about is that that's not sufficient, right? If you look at the data center as a whole, the compute side has followed the trajectory of the pictures on the top. It has gone from these highly isolated boxes to a box that is highly disaggregated, and there were obviously the, the sample applications in between, and then finally you get the picture that it looks like today, where you have a highly disaggregated system. Applications run on any infrastructure. You don't go buy the, the trading computer and the uh, database computer and the so-and-so computer. What you do is you say, I bought generic infrastructure, and I'm going to run whatever compute app I want on it. If you look at all the applications we've been talking about even today, right? XDP, eBPF, yes, they can both be offloaded, wherever Jamal is, uh, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. The fundamental idea there is that you're basically saying, I don't want to rebuild my hardware infrastructure so I can run a slightly more innovative or largely more innovative application. What we, Cumulus, and I think this community needs to get to is where the bottom picture begins to look the same. So you have networking today that still fundamentally looks like big iron boxes. It's stuck in the 80s mode of operation. It's monolithic, it's invisible, it's hard to manage, it creates its own ecosystem. 
into something that looks more like a generic IP fabric, and then eventually the whole data center is a Linux uh, expression and not the other way around. So where do we want to go? Right? And, and it's a little bit of a future-looking statement, but it's also a little bit of a present statement, because this is happening. This, this transition is already happening today. And fundamentally, what we want to get to is we want to get to the point where the physical switches and the routers also run Linux. And this is an interesting point, and I'll, I'll, I'll dwell on this slide for a few minutes. Because in this universe and in this infrastructure, the data plane of Linux is sort of de-emphasized a little bit. But the control plane, all the protocols that run, the way interfaces are managed, the way um, objects are represented, the way a pipeline is represented, is still the fundamental Linux kernel pipeline. And if you keep it that way, what you get to be able to say is that those black spider boxes can now live on every element in your system. And you don't have to wonder whether you can run an XDP program in your network or you can run it on your host. You don't have to wonder whether you can run Wireshark in your network or in your host. You don't have to have a conversation in the company of, oh, I, put to, I want to put a VLAN on my host. How the hell do I put that same VLAN on the switch that it's connected to? And the thing that I want to sort of emphasize and make sure everybody agrees to is the solution from a networking perspective only works when this whole picture has been realized. In the absence of realizing this picture, you're always going to have this discontinuity, lack of completeness, at the boundary between where the host and the network meet. And the one fact, I think it's a reality for us all today, is that the host without the network will not survive, because everything has been built around a scale-out model, whether it's the public cloud people or the private cloud people or even your home data center. Most of us have more than one computer at home running a network that stitches them all together. So. This slide mostly is there just to make a point, right? If you look at why Linux is the right answer, and to, to sort of uh, analyze the point I just made, you look at everything that's here. And this is a smattering. If I have uh, missed somebody's commit, I'm sorry. Uh, it was not a point to go highlight specific things or, or de-highlight specific things. The point here was to make, the point I'm trying to make here is, if you look at the Linux kernel, it's today by far the top vehicle for innovation. You look at this list, and this is, uh, I used to say 2015, Jamal made me say 2016 as well. And, uh, and, and actually, there's a point there, and I want to make it, which is, it's because most of these things are still in development, and that's a good thing. We were able to, as a community, bring innovative features to the market, lead the market in certain directions, and we have the the horsepower, the community passion to be able to keep working on it and to keep improving it till it becomes a highly usable feature. This is not something that pretty much anybody in this industry can lay claim to. This is a real problem, right? I mean, most people talk about highly established vendors in the space, and they are still talking about their top feature being in beta for a year because that's how long it takes for them to go from, I have a thought, to I can actually validate this use case. Whereas if you are leveraging this community, you get to short circuit that and speed that up in ways that no one vendor can ever hope to achieve or hope to compete with. And this list is actually very impressive. I mean, some of these bullets are not equivalent. Some bullets represent tons of work and some not so much, but it's a very, very impressive list. And then there's XDP. And this is... Uh, not just because Dave is so um, passionate about XDP, but it's also because it addresses a very explicit requirement in our networks today, which is people are building networking appliances and then doing all kinds of short circuits and breaking the Linux infrastructure. And I mean, the point that I maybe should have put in one of the slides, but I didn't, is networking is about interconnecting things. And you cannot interconnect things if you don't know what the hell is on the other side. And to be able to establish that something is, that is on the other side is going to be able to talk to you, you need a model. And that's what Linux provides. If Linux is the model, then doing things with, uh, with XDP, with eBPF, with well-understood and sanctioned interfaces 
is a giant step forward than just completely subverting Linux, doing everything on your own, and having people wonder whether ARP is going to work for you or not, which is, if you think about it, a very, very scary place to be. So who is Cumulus, and why would, why would anyone care? Um, so what Cumulus is doing, and has been doing for a while now, is to effectively bring the idea of web-scale networking for the enterprise cloud. Now, clearly, there are people in this room who've built massive infrastructure on the networking side along the lines of what I'm talking about. This is not news to a lot of people. What, what we have done is we've created a distribution. It's a Debian-based distribution. It runs pure Linux, in a sense. And the user interface, the application interface, is purely a Linux experience. It runs on open hardware and therefore allows you to benefit from the entire Linux ecosystem. Not just the people in this room, but it's a much larger ecosystem of people who write apps against Linux VMs, people who test automation tools against Linux VMs, people who, for whom, if you ever took Linux off the table, they wouldn't know what to do in their entire day. That's the ecosystem that this solution sort of uh, benefits from. And in return, what you get is customers that are able to use a wide variety of hardware and be able to benefit from all the advances that this community has made over the years. So the question that I, I'm here to talk about is, we believe the solution is possible. We believe all the components exist. Why isn't Linux what is running every enterprise's network? I mean, this is a, a question that is worth pondering, right? It's if everything was there and it was easy and accessible and, and uh, the ecosystem was there, why is it not prevalent everywhere? So the, the simple answer is packaging. There's a few things that need to be worked on. Some of them require kernel work, and we'll talk about them in a second. There's a few things that require a, a greater ecosystem outside the kernel. We'll talk about that as well. And then there's the mindset and focus and understanding. And what I'm hoping to achieve here is to have a greater appreciation in the community of all three of them. So let's talk with the things that are the features that are in the kernel that that have a major impact in the enterprise. The very first one is ETH tool, and, and I'm sure there's a large number of people, even in this room, who say ETH tool, yeah, that thing that gives you some, some numbers. But when you're in, a, in an enterprise network, and, and this is a number that will, or a statistic that will shock some people, I suspect, you're spending more money on cables than any other piece of equipment in your data center. ETH tool suddenly becomes a very, very important thing. Your ability to identify a cable, to see if it's operating in its right operating parameters, whether the error rate is right or wrong, if it's identified the right way or not, is a very big deal. And in, in sort of the Linux ecosystem, the forefront, the, the component, the tool that defines, validates, tests whether a cable is to spec, whether the programming of the cable is correct or not, is ETH tool. And as some of us, I'm sure some of you know, we are having this transition from 10 gig, 40 gig to 2,500 gig. This is a big, big step. And it's, a, it's got lots of complications and nuances about how auto uh, error correction happens and uh, auto negotiation works and a whole bunch of other things. And that all needs to go into ETH tool. That needs to become the de facto standard. That needs to be the thing that everybody can hang their hat on without any, any hesitation. Um, Cumulus has been obviously working in this space quite a bit, and you know, if there are people in the community who want to do more, more encouragement from us. The second thing is the bridging model. Again, a favorite whipping boy for a lot of people. The bridge is slow, the bridge has problems, the bridge is this, the bridge is that. It turns out that in physical networks today, the number one model is a bridge, because mostly because of the rise of enterprise networks being built around the likes of virtual switches, which expect everybody to be on a large layer two segment. The physical devices underneath are dumb bridges, but they need to support all of the bridging protocols. STP needs to work. Networks need to not melt. It's kind of a strange requirement. And, uh, and a whole bunch of functions that sit on top of it need to work in a reliable way. You don't have these, they don't play. Another example, multicast. I think anybody who's uh, I'm going to say something slightly offensive, but anybody who's a big proponent of multicast 
today should re-examine whether that's the right position to take or not. However, there are many, many, many enterprise networks where multicast is implicit to the way they work. They use it for rendezvous, they use it to figure out if a service is alive or not. They have legacy applications that have high performance multicast. And then there are the trading and financial segments that use multicast in a very, um, in a far more efficient way and actually probably is the one right use case for multicast. Now, we as a group can say, okay, multicast doesn't need to be in most of the high performance paths because you know, virtual machines don't need them, containers don't need them, all the progressive technologies don't need them. However, the model needs to be preserved and backward compatibility needs to be there. And if you're going to ever get into an enterprise network, these functions have to work the way they need to work. The last one is VXLAN scale. And it, actually, it's, a, it's more about scale. The problem, if you look at a host, typically is your 4, 8, 10, 16 interfaces. Most switching devices come with 128 devices can go up to like tens of thousands of virtual devices at the end of the day. Uh, if you're following the mailing list, you'll see Cumulus people are always talking about uh, NetDev scale and uh, NetLink scale and all of these objects that the kernel is moving around. And at some point, these relatively small objects become incredibly complex and incredibly hard to move around at high speed. And it's, again, it's a slight fo shift in focus. Instead of thinking of a box as having single digit number of interfaces, if you start thinking of them as having three digit number of interfaces, a lot of things begin to look a lot different. Route path selection. I think for anybody who's looked at routing in the Linux kernel, you'll know that we have a large v4, v6, mindset difference. The v6 implementation came in later, came in with a much cleaner approach in some ways, but the v4 implementation has had a lot of legacy, has had many years and many iterations of work. There was the routing cache solution, which is now much improved with, with removing it and having policy enforcement in a far more reasonable way. However, if you look at this from the perspective of an enterprise user, they don't understand that difference. They don't want to know why it makes sense to the Linux community. To them, it's a, it's a mind-boggling thing that v4 is done one way and v6 is done a different way. So we as a community have to figure out pathways how we can, without abandoning the legacy users, in, in the way that we move forward, unify these things such that the end user experience for v4 and v6 is actually seamless. Because the one thing we do know is that more and more companies are going towards v6, and more and more companies understand the value of the larger address space and all of the functional improvements that v6 brought with it. VRF, um, as Tom mentioned, we spend a bunch of time on this. David's, David Ahern's been spending a bunch of time making this a first-class first citizen for a whole bunch of applications. And the one major thing here is without a, a key component like VRF, you cannot actually go into a large multi-tenancy layer three cloud. You need to be able to separate your layer three segments. Think of it as VLANs for layer three. And this was one of the reasons why Cumulus took such a large interest in it. And I believe that as we go forward, you will see more, if you're building a more and more integrated solution between the host and the physical network, you're going to do, use mechanisms like VRF to build those segments and to separate them out uh, end to end. And the last thing along the same line, now it's a it's kind of boring repetitive theme, is MPLS, right? So MPLS is uh, the label-based forwarding technology that a lot of service providers use as edge, as edge networks. And if you look at the picture that I was drawing, the piece of the picture that I didn't have was how does that edge router eventually connect to the internet? 99.9% .9 today, that's an MPLS circuit of some kind. And if you really are going to get to the point where end-to-end -end functionality is going to be available, then you need to have MPLS. And it was for this reason that Eric started the MPLS program, Rupa did the LWT editions, and uh, we've had a bunch of other people contribute on fixing the MPLS data path. And what I want to emphasize here, sort of again, at, the, as, at an overall level is, you look at these things at, at a, as a totality and you'll realize that these are things that are needed for the enterprise networks to make progress. They cannot move forward without components like this being first-class citizens, being 
comparable to what is the standards in the industry today. And, and that's what we've obviously been focusing on, but I would encourage a larger uh, participation in the community. And once you have the kernel going, as we all know, right? I mean, I think we all have, I suspect, at some point, unconsciously substituted Linux from a kernel to a distribution because it's become sort of an a, a, a easy word for many, many different implications and applications today. So you need a bigger ecosystem, right? A kernel by itself doesn't interact with users because it has no user space. So there are things you need to do, and we'll cover them in separate slides, but you need to have an ecosystem. So we did things like Oni, which allows uh, a switch to be remote booted, which was a, a, a huge step forward in 2013, which blew my mind. Um, we'll talk about FRR a little bit. It's a routing suite that uh, Cumulus contributed to the Linux Foundation, along with Sixwind and Orange and a few other, um, few other companies. And the point I wanted to make was the routing performance in your box matters. And today the kernel keeps the routing policy outside the kernel, which is the right thing to do. And for that matter, you need a vibrant, open routing stack, a stack that actually applies to a whole bunch of applications, is accessible to a whole bunch of developers, and allows you to build a routed fabric that is uh, coherent with the modern technology. So, so we'll talk more about that. We'll come to that. But it actually is one of the engines that feeds and feeds uh, technologies like switch dev that will allow, over time, to have a basic device driver interface that says, now the routing suite doesn't care what's underneath me. Bring in the hardware that works. Bring in the hardware with a driver that's at the right level. My routing performance, my routing compatibility, my networking aspect of my network box is still well understood, and it's encapsulated by FRR. Another thing that we do, did sorry, uh, is uh, we worked a lot on user interfaces. Same thing again, right? If you're managing four interfaces on a server, Linux is OK manageable. You get to 1015, even then, Network Manager and all the other things start kicking in. And I'm sure if we took a poll here, Network Manager would get less than 50% of people going, yeah, that's the tool I dream about using. Exactly. Um, so, uh, so Rupa actually spent a bunch of time doing, building this thing called IFAP Down 2, which is, uh, we'll talk again more, a little bit more about it in a second, but it's a highly extensible interface management system, which was required for enterprise users, because uh, I'll give you a simple example. If you had to add five VLANs to 64 ports, you had to go edit like a 250-line config file which is not just annoying and boring and highly confusing, it's also incredibly prone to errors. And you want to not have that kind of problem in an enterprise network. You do not want to find out the New York Times network came down because somebody mistyped a five instead of a six and uploaded that configuration. It's a, it's a kind of problem you never want to have to go explain to anybody else about. We did um, this thing called NCLU. We'll talk more about that as well. And we talked about the protocols. And in the protocol space, the two things that we are very focused on right now, and I think the industry as a whole is very focused on, is EVPN and MPLS. And both of them effectively allow you to build what the industry would call L3 VPNs, a layer three virtual private network, so that I can now create isolated segments, create tenants, route between them efficiently, and route into them efficiently from outside the network. Um, you will see a lot more work coming from us in this space, and I suspect you will see a lot more work in both of those protocol spaces as we go forward, as we move into enterprise networking. Um, so this was an example of something we've done. The page is a little hard to read, or the slide is a little hard to read. This is an Ubuntu packages list. IFAP down to has been submitted. It's actually, uh, if you can read this from behind, it's in the Xenial... Uh, LTS package list. You can install it, run it, do what you want to do with it. I encourage people to adopt it in every, every distribution possible, because once you start looking at large-scale device lists, we have some experience to be able to say that this is important. 
It supports templating, it handles dependencies, it validates configuration, it's written in Python, it's extensible, it slices bread, no, sorry, it doesn't do that. Um, and for a Debian distribution, you can just use it, but if you are a YUM or a Red Hat based distribution and somebody wants to go try porting it and packaging it, uh, you will get all the support you want from us. We talked about this thing called NCLU. This is another thing, right? So we, we would go to these enterprise users time and time again, and like I said, they don't want to edit VLANs in 200 lines. They don't want to have to go figure out that if I change my IP address here, I need to restart my uh, DHCP server, or I need to restart my name server, and they don't want to understand how each of these daemons have potential cross linkages and when and where these linkages break, and if they renamed an interface, who all do they need to tell, and so on and so forth. So, so we had a big problem, right? And we said, okay, so the answer is a CLI, like every other network switching vendor in the world. And there were many people, including me, who said never, because that fundamentally breaks Linux. It fundamentally breaks the Linux user space interface. So after much arm wrestling, hand wrangling, and discussions and conversations, we came up with a very clever idea. So we have this project called NCLU. At some point, we will make this available to other distributions as well. What it does is it's, a, it's again, a Python-based daemon that sits on top of all the standard user space tools. So you interact with it as if you're interacting with a CLI. It uses incredibly modern technologies like Git and Diff to manage uh, all of the infrastructure that's inside it. And it basically allows you to interact with it as if it's a modal CLI. It's actually non-modal, but it behaves almost like, it do, like a modal CLI. And what you get at the end of it is actions get taken on Linux config files, action get taken on Linux daemons, and all of the validation tools that are available underneath it all get exercised and invoked. And you can find out exactly what you need to do if you don't want to run it again and never look at it again. The end user is literally a everybody wins strategy. Right? The config files are still there. You can use automation to just slap in config files anytime you want. But if you want to automate through such a CLI, you can do that as well. And since it's a stateless, fundamentally stateless, it does do some caching, but it's fundamentally a stateless uh, daemon and a uh, comp stateless component, you don't have to worry about any idiosyncrasies that it introduces to your system, bugs notwithstanding. And that's a standard disclaimer on all of these sentences. And the last thing I want to talk about was uh, free-range routing, what used to be called uh, Quagga. And uh, Quagga has been, I would say, a very, very successful open source program in terms of reach. There are people running very important websites using Quagga as their edge router, running on a Linux box, unsurprisingly. Um, but what, what had happened was, what we saw when we sort of started interacting with the community is that the community wasn't moving fast enough. There were lots of modern technologies, eVPN as a classic example, uh, and VRFs too, that were being introduced, but the time it took to get that supported in the routing ecosystem was taking way longer than we liked. And clearly it was beginning to hamper us because we didn't want to get out in front of the community. So. After much hand wrangling here as well, we decided, along with the partners listed down there, that we're going to go fork Quagga into a new program. And at the time of fork, we were about like a thousand patches deviated, because that was the rate at which the Quagga community was moving at the time. So um, we have gone ahead, done this. It supports, as of today, it supports BGP. I don't know why it says four only. It supports BGP four and six. It supports OSPF two three. RIP, LDP is actually in the works, ISIS is in the works, and that's not a bad word, it's a routing protocol for people not familiar with it. And the model that we want this to go towards is, and we already actually are on that road, is you can get a routing VM, you can get a routing container, you can use it to route natively on your server, on your application, on your little handheld device if you want because it uses standard Linux kernel backend interfaces. And of course, if you have switches that are running something like Cumulus, you'll get that as your core routing suite. And again, you're not going to be surprised by some protocol interaction, or you're not going to be wondering whether 
if I send a message, this guy will receive it and do the right thing with it or not. This is, in my opinion, a very big deal, and it's actually one of the things that if we are super focused on the host and we don't think about the larger picture, a lot of people don't pay attention to. And I'll admit very freely that before I started working on switching hardware, I totally didn't care about it. But since I have, I've come to realize that unless for the, for the sort of the whole data center solution, unless the solution hangs together top to bottom, it's not a complete solution. And as long as it's not a complete solution, its value is less than the sum of its parts. And, and in, in that sense, this is a very important piece of glue. So I wanted to switch to the last section of my slide. Uh, and, and this is something that, again, if you're in the networking field, you'll hear a lot of conversations and a lot of chatter about. And uh, for people who are wondering, Troy McClure here is uh, suggesting that the Linux kernel is getting in your way, because that's the line that I hear a lot out in the industry. And, uh, and I have a few thoughts about that. So the very specific thing that I want to talk about is what constitutes an operating system and what constitutes a user interface. In my humble opinion, um, the picture as drawn is the way an operating system should behave. There should be a system call interface. The system call interface is what applications and user interaction is modeled against. If you model it here, apps become portable, uh, and things just work. If you don't model it that way, as in you make the system call interface your hardware interface, you get non-portable applications. In fact, um, Stephen was talking about that this morning. If, you're, if your device is named by your device driver, every time you change an, an, a NIC card, you're going to have to rewrite your app, or in the very least, recompile it, which is not a good thing. Um, it ends up with very narrow use cases, like what your particular application, or sorry, what your particular hardware does that day is what your application can do that day. If you change your hardware, you have to rethink how your application works. And ultimately, it leads to a lot of hair pulling, which is not a good thing. Um, the right way you build a system such that it's extensible, such that you have broad customer buy-in and broad consumer buy-in, is by moving the device-specific functionality to the device driver layer, which is exactly what Linux has propounded for, for its history of existence. Doing it here makes it good, and it also makes it such that the end user experience actually improves over the years. It doesn't, it's un, uncontroversially going to improve over the years because the hardware vendor is going to make the hardware look better and build standardized interfaces to interact with that hardware. And if you don't do it that way, you will end up with a specialty use case that may or may not ever be replicated in the next generation. So, and there are challenges to this model. There is a list of solutions out there, Sonic, OpenSwitch, FBOSS, and a whole bunch of other networking stacks that have gone down the road of saying that the right answer to networking is that networking is just an application. It has no system-wide implication at all. And it, therefore, should have direct access to hardware at the system call layer, at the syscall layer. And clearly, in my humble opinion, that's the wrong way to go. But I think it's something that we as a community have to pay attention to, because there are, there are reasons why they like that, right? It's, it's velocity, it's speed of execution, it's uh, being able to manifest features in hardware on a, on a quick turn basis. However, if you do it that way, you're making a, a a long-term wrong trade-off in my mind, where you're going to be stuck with what choice you made today for the rest of your life, and if you ever want to change that, whether it's a, a box, a vendor, or, or even a, an application, you're going to have to rethink everything about how you deploy things. On the other hand, if you use Linux, then you don't even actually have to make a choice. Linux is not getting in your way, because all the things you don't care about uh, don't care about it. There are enough people in the community, in the greater community, that will make sure it works. It's not a headache or a hair-pulling inducing component. Moreover, your hosts already run it, so you, you will likely get a, a speed up in terms of tool, uh, tool integration. If you were to buy in into things like SwitchDev, ETHTool, and 
Hopefully everybody understands why I'm equating them here. But switch dev eth tool will give you a layer to integrate with. It gives you the right delineation. You pick the layer at which you want to incorporate, integrate, and move forward. But you don't have to rethink the whole stack from the bottom up. And finally, and I think most importantly, you get the largest software community as built-in support. This, this de-risks your deployment in ways that you cannot fathom. Because literally, I don't know if I should finish this sentence, but literally you could lose this entire room and Linux will keep working. Right? There, is no, there is enough resiliency in the system that nothing can beat it. And, and that's one of its biggest value, and especially if you're going to make a career deciding choice, something that defines whether or not, okay, maybe it's not that important, but whether you'll get fired or not, this is the kind of resiliency you should be looking for. So bottom line, use the Linux kernel as the model and become part of the solution, not part of the problem. And that's all I had. Any questions uh, for Jamal? Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Antoine from the Linux Weekly News. Could you expand a little on um, why uh, Quago was forked and the differences between um, the, the fork and uh, Quago at this point in terms of features? Okay, let me see if I got the question right. The question was, can you explain a little bit more about the history, why there was a fork, and, and the differences? Um, so it's a little bit outside the scope of this conference, obviously, uh, but I, I see why it's an important question. Um, fundamentally, what, if you look at the history of Quagga, what, uh, it, it went through a few key maintainers. Actually, let me take that back. Let me say it very simply. The maintenance for Quagga, the community, was nowhere near the quality of the maintenance for Linux kernel networking. And we, living in both these communities, realized this vast difference and wanted to move such that it gets closer. Not that we have that ambitious an aspiration, but we will do everything we can to make it be the same level, achieve the same level of efficiency and the same amount of applicability. Now, those are sort of fluffy, high-level words. Specifically, there were many technology components that needed to go in. The, the, the routing stack, for example, for OSPA v3, when we started looking at it versus where we ended up with patching it was somewhere in the order of like 4,000x speed up. And fundamentally, what it meant to us was that nobody was looking at this as something that they would hang their hat on and, and define their career on. And we needed that, the community to have that kind of impetus. Because at the end of the day, like anything else, right, something gets better because people care about it. And we needed to create a community of people who cared about it enough to participate and give them an avenue to move forward. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's all I got. More questions? Great. Another round of applause. Uh, so.